by thanking our glorious sponsors, uh, Raid, who helped sponsor this, the freediving event, uh, DeeperBlue.com, which probably has the largest global platform of freediving content. Uh, check it out if, you, if you're not familiar with it, Deep, DeeperBlue.com. And then uh, Shearwater Research, uh, their new computer, the Terek, of course, they've now added freediving functionality, and uh, I don't think they have technical freediving yet, but uh, they're probably working on it. So um, anyway, um, and let me just quickly introduce our guests. We have Mandy Ray Kroc on the end, Adam Sellers, you probably saw them during the day while you were all at the presentations, Neil Pollock, Dr. Neil Pollock, Kirk Kroc, Thibaut Guinea, Guinea, is that good? Amber Burke from Australia. So. I'd like to start, um, interesting, I did a, an article recently and looked at uh, diver fatalities, uh, looking at Dan statistics, and roughly 100 to 120 scuba diving deaths a year, technical diving deaths, about 20 to 25, and a uh, large proportion of those are rebreather deaths. And I was really surprised to see that, again, over these years, that 50 to 65 free diving or breath hold de deaths, which seemed odd to me because you'd think the tech divers would be, you know, the most in number. Um, anyway, so I wanted to start by maybe uh, just asking what, what's that about? Why is the, the fatality rate so high, for example? We don't know the denominator. We don't know how many deaths that represents, just the numerator. But uh, yeah, what's, what's going on with freediving safety? Well, I think that's because so many deaths get lumped into freediving deaths. And, and a lot of these aren't actually trained freedivers. So Probably, in my opinion, I wouldn't call a lot of them freediving deaths, like breath hold deaths. Um, in Australia, definitely, we have we're brought up and we do a lot of underwater swimming. Like as a kid in your backyard, kids are always competing with it, each other to see how many laps you can do underwater. And you know, this is a hazard, and because we are so unaware of freediving as a sport, people are really unaware of the safety issues. So these are a lot of untrained freedivers. Accidents happen. And you also have snorkelers and scuba divers, uh, not scuba divers, spear fishermen. So, yeah, a, lo a lot of these um, breath holding deaths get lumped into free diving deaths. Um, but in like, you know, trained free divers and, and free diving training and free diving competition, yeah, you don't see those fatalities. It, it, it does seem like a misconception. I know people say to me, oh, God, co competitive free, that's really dangerous. And it's like, Actually not. It's very safe. Uh, two, two fatalities in the last 30 years. Yeah, Neil. I think it is worth separating these dives from free diving, but I think it's more important to look at them overall as breath hold fatalities. Mm. So of the breath hold fatalities, it's probably excessive hyperventilation that is causing most of them. And yes, those are probably mostly untrained people, often people who are playing in swimming pools. But I think we have to start with a big picture of breath hold and then say, yes, free diving, if it's done properly with the right controls, it can be safe. But let's not go away from breath hold because breath hold is a risk because it doesn't take any equipment. People can do it at home. They can do it with nothing. And so we have to focus on that core group to keep them safe to make sure you have healthy free divers. Mm. The, the one thing I see with it, though, is um, like I understand why you need to group it, at least right now. Um, as somebody in the industry teaching in that, the thing that would be nice with differentiating it is that we get caught up with pools and that that won't allow us to offer training to teach people how to do it safely because somebody who once held their breath drowned. And uh, they may not have even been trying to do anything that was technically free diving, but they were doing breath hold. But we get lumped into right. the free divers, trained free divers get lumped into the same category and it affects us negatively. But I, I can understand why it's really hard to, to pick apart who's doing it for what reasons. Well, that's it. And it, it is about picking apart. You have to realize we started the breath hold incident database at, at uh, I started at Duke actually, and then it transitioned to Dan. But a lot of the reports we get are lay public reports. So we would identify based on what people were described as, we often don't know. We would love to be able to know exactly what people were doing, but we don't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Where, it gets, where it gets trickiest is in the pool when you have a lifeguard who's really well trained, he may be a free diver, but he's doing it uh, for whatever motivation. It, again, to me, if we can get everybody understanding the risks, I'm less concerned about the label because we should have fewer problems. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, one of my pet peeves is anyone can be a freediver. 
um, you know, hold your breath, go down to the bottom of the pool and label yourself a free diver. But for me, you're a free diver if you've actually been trained and taken a proper course. Other than that, you're just a snorkeler who's going way too deep for your inexperience and the risk that you're putting yourself mm. under at that point. Mm. And I think to Amber's point as well is that there's, unlike scuba, there's no gatekeeper. There's no dive shop that's not going to sell you long blade fins, low volume mask. You can go to the internet and grab a whole bunch of information on free diving that extols the virtues of certain techniques, but very rarely will you see the reasons why you shouldn't do or you should moderate the use of those techniques as, mm. as well. Whereas in the scuba industry, you've got the gatekeeper, which is the dive shop. That's not going to wrench you your tank, put you on the right. charter boat or anything like that. And to Mandy's point as well, is that's affecting you know, collectively our ability to train people because the pools are, um, are denying our access um, in which to, for us to do our job. And, you know, there's fatalities in swimming. We don't close off access to swimming pools because right. of that. You offer more access to proper training and courses in a pool. It's something I'd like to write about, that whole issue in the States, uh, because I know at our pool, too, they, you know, no breath holding, period. So, you know. Part of the reason behind that is the, the media has picked up a term, the shallow water blackout. Oh, if yeah. a kid dies in a pool, they call it shallow water blackout. They have no concept of the relationship, and that's really made it easy. And yeah. you're right, in the U.S., it was a huge problem of pools banning breath hold. And you have to remember, every respiratory cycle ends in a breath hold. To right. ban breath hold is really very silly, but to encourage safe practice would be smarter. But we are... We are stuck by the language, and it would be good to write about this and to try to that help. issue, yeah. Well, and cave divers faced some of this early on, too. A lot of the cave fatalities were untrained scuba divers venturing into the caves, and, and so hence the, the sign in front of all the caves now, you know, danger, don't go in here unless you're trained. What, uh, what can freediving, or what, what are you collectively doing in, in the freediving world to help uh, make people aware, make people aware of the need of training, that sort of thing. Well, I guess besides courses, there's a lot of educational in initiatives. Uh, you know, Dive Safe, um, a number of ones like that that are out there doing that. Is that uh, Ted's new uh, dive, dive Safe, Ted Hardy? No. Yeah, Julie Richardson. Ah. Yeah. Um, there was an initiative in, in um, packaging of free dive specific equipment to put in pamphlets huh? to it at one point. Um, and then, you know, I think really um, one of the things that we've been talking about trying and, and actually approached Dan about it at one point was just that initiative to go to the pools and to try and get an understanding of, of what it is that the free dive community, the professional free dive community who practice and do this, uh, you know, with protocols and procedures and, and, and a safe attitude are trying to actually get done when we are training people to mm. prevent the fatalities. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it takes a, a group to come together to actually make all of, right. that, ha all of that happen. Right. There, and, the, and there isn't an equivalent, uh, like in scuba, they have the training council and other RTC and all that. There isn't that in the, the breath hold room. Yep. Yeah, I think as the sport gets bigger, uh, people will become more aware of the risks and that way we can train more people and yeah, show more people about shallow water blackout or whatever you want to call it and that, yeah, there is, you know, there is something you can do to mitigate that risk and, and you can pull someone out of the pool and it's not, yeah, it's not necessarily like... In freediving, um, people don't generally die from shallow water blackout uh, because you can pull them up. And if everyone knows how to do that, and if they see that happen in a pool, then, yeah, we can really do something about those fatalities. Yeah. Tipo. And uh, we, we talked about like people who don't know freediving, who hasn't been educated to freediving, but also I think on the other side uh, of the panel, uh, freediving is often presented as a very extreme sport and, and we need to separate as well competitive freediving and recreational freediving. Mm. But the thing is there is no clear definition because there is no WRSTC or stuff like this to really define. And it's a talk I had with Dan here. Is like, yeah. Because for insurance as, uh, as well, like at the moment they are not sure are we insured, are we not insured. Uh, so... 
at one point there will be need for a council defining what, what is recreational freediving. And to me, like during the courses, for example, I never heard of, maybe it's because I'm not well informed, but of any fatalities during a course, like a beginner course. Me, since I'm teaching freediving, before I used to, to teach scuba diving, I feel so much more relaxed and safe about my students. Like, mm. it really feels like if I want someone to drown, I need to hold his head underwater for it, you know? So, like, if you have the right uh, safety procedures, the right courses, it's, like, very, very safe. Uh, so, I think a definition as well of what is freediving mm. uh, on this side as well would, would help uh, bringing awareness uh, about it. Good point. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like Thibaut, like you said, there's um, there, we don't know of any fatalities in in instruction, but there's actually one, and it was the instructor themselves, huh? yeah. and that was Natalia huh? um, teaching students, and then went off on her own, in some ways against some of what would be some very basic standard protocols. Mm -hmm. um, so, at, at unfortunately, in some avenues and some people in the high end of our sport, um, they don't actually follow what they preach. Or sometimes, for example, the idea of being able to go out and do negative pressure dives, um, you know, as a training thing and, and not having to worry about there being a buddy there um, from some of the, or a top person isn't necessarily a great role model. So mm -hmm. I think even within our professional community, there's outliers that, um, you know, it's a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Right. You can come up and say, this is what we need to do, but if you're not really practicing what you preach, it just gets worse as the information gets disseminated. Yes. Yeah, and, you, and you've got a lot of, you know, you've got a lot of very popular programs out there at the moment which are fantastic for climbing Everest in your board shorts. Um, <laughs> but they're super popular. I mean, I've only had one blackout in all of the courses I've run and it was from a guy using an intense hyperventilation technique that he saw online mm. and then a massive breath at the end and he blacked out in his chair. Huh. You know, like, and, and that was from watching YouTube and then practicing that before he came and then going, well, well that guy kind of advertises that it's freediving. Had he ever been in the ocean? Who knows? But he right. brought that to the course as like, oh, this is how I do it. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation out there. And it's, it's hard, like, when I hear like, oh, 50 breath holding. When I first heard that, I was like, really? Like, we, I think we do have to separate that because, you know, I was, a, I was a competitive swimmer. And you've got swim coaches who'll sit up there with 50 squad members and they're doing hypoxic work. Mm. One guy who's not even trained how to bring someone back from a blackout is standing up there going, all right, we're going to do hypoxic work for the next hour. Mm. And then that gets, that gets put into a breath holding type of, you know, right. statistic, which right. is... Shit. It's a breath holding. Yeah. Man. Well, yeah, but not, not, <laughs> not in the sense of like breath holding with freediving because it's completely separate. Yes, it is, but yeah, you so can't be offended. Be a it's a breath holding. Yeah. yeah. Freediving is a subset. Breath mm. hold is the whole enchilada. Yeah, just yeah. getting people right. to understand that there's the two. Yeah, right. but the lead out here was like there's, you know, there's more deaths in freediving. It didn't say breath holding activities. It was 50 in free diving. And I didn't see that because no. Yeah. I mean, so, in the database we maintain, it's always described as a breath, a breath hold incident in a database. Yeah, that is right. the name. Yeah. And in terms yes. of free diving, that's almost always been the lowest percentage rank of the identified cases, and most of them aren't identified. So we have never tried to, to demonize breath, uh, free diving. Right. No, but maybe a good thing would be to to add a free diving statistic. Well, there like, is a free diving oh, okay, statistic. So there is breath hold yeah, and you have free to diving. Realize, so then, then again, the evidence is almost free. always incomplete. If we have evidence that indicated it was a free diving event, it would be flagged as such. If we have evidence that it was spear fishing, that's easy because there's usually some evidence. But the challenge is, you could have somebody who's going out spear fishing and they're done their spear fishing for the day, and then maybe they try to do something that's more like what we would call free diving. So there's always room in the in the description and we try to be conservative but we certainly don't ever describe all deaths as free diving gotcha. but we do describe them all as breath hold events i'll start just this is good for me too as a journalist start segmenting that in my my language breath hold and free diving sort of used interchangeably but maybe free diving for trained divers and breath hold for the general 
the general category. Maybe. One thing I, you have to be cautious that I understand Kirk's point that he wants to draw the line at being formally certified or trained. There are some people who, even if, if they're legacy or they're self-trained, some people are free divers, even if they don't have that formal training. Right. So you have to be a little careful on yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we, we have a whole community in the uh, in Philippines forming, and there is this, uh, this guy, no name, but teaching, teaching people and teaching like crazy things and offering it as free diving courses. Like uh, yeah. I saw a video online of someone with a phone alone, offshore with a buoy and saying, oh, now I'm doing like, uh, like we said in the course, I'm calling my coach to tell him I'm okay. And she was diving alone, you know? Damn. And, <laughs> but his point is like, yeah, better teach them this that, than teach them nothing. So we have to fight very hard in Philippines to, to tell people, yeah, it goes through certification with a certified instructor if you want to, to practice safely. And this is just one of the many examples of what this mm. guy is doing. So we also have that kind of things to deal with to, wow. to really yeah. bring awareness to people. Mm. I, think, I think there's you know, basic standards and protocols that we can follow, like always be with a buddy, you know, arm's length and wait 30 seconds, things like that. Um, but I think when you look at free diving from a market point of view, it is the hot thing to do now. Uh, right. It's the growing segment within the diving industry. Um, all the diving organizations are jumping in on it. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, there's the great dumbing down of free diving education in what would have been a quality of, of free diving education now is in some ways potentially a, a rush to market share. Mm. And at one point, we would see organizations getting in and developing programs where the instructor was allowed to stay on the surface while the student went to 30 meters. Now, we would all agree that, you know, that's ludicrous. Right. Um, number one, you can't even help educate the student if you're not seeing the problems they're having at depth, a technical problem, not safety right. problems, but then how do you even take care of the safety aspect of it? And those things are being corrected. So that's what I get as there's, or my previous point was this dumbing down mm -hmm. of the photocopy of the photocopy. You have such lax standards in some ways um, thinking, basically taking the idea that free diving, well, let's just market it like it's an advanced form of snorkeling mm -hmm. to make it easy to get into. When really compared to scuba, the, the risk to us is hypoxia that debilitates you immediately. And it's not the hypoxia that kills you. It's the drowning that ensues after that. Right. Unlike scuba, where if I run out of gas and I've got an, another air source or my buddy, I have immediate steps that I can take because I'm somewhat in a cognitive ability or, you know, different things like that. But for us, it's a debilitating thing that happens like, like that. Right. So, um, I mean, I would like to see the standards get better within the organizations rather than the dumbing down of them. All right. All right. Does the RTC, uh, I want to move on to other topics too, but, and groups like that, are, do they even look at free diving or is it just scuba? They're, they're not talking about the free diving component. Well, we're just revising the RSTC medical form now, and it huh. certainly doesn't, it, it's focused on general health of diving. So there was a little discussion of free diving, but there's nothing specific hmm. to free diving there. Huh. So it sounds like that's something that. But the, the, the good point is, as the big agencies are all jumping in free diving, it will come on the table at one point, uh, hopefully soon. But yeah. uh, of course, like already, like the main agencies, you like are converging on some of the standards. I'm not saying they are good or bad. Huh? I'm just saying at one point they will unify a bit, like with scuba diving. They all have their still their specificities, but there is a, mm -hmm. a base of of standard that is... Uh, Everybody has yeah. to meet. Uh, to but be it's, not st it's still not yet the case, but it's getting there yeah. little by little, I think. Well, let's switch. I want to talk a little now about uh, technical free diving. Uh, I, <laughs> I find this interesting because just in talking to people in the community, I've gotten a lot of from, from what is that? Mixed gas, I don't understand, to... Uh, that's not free diving, you know, that's, that's not natural, it's something else, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so maybe you can d define it for us, uh, Kirk, since you've been working on that, and we can talk about yeah, technical so, free diving. Yeah, so 
technical freediving to cut to the chase is the right tool for the job, for the job you're doing at times. And I'm a purist in freediving. I mean, I believe just one breath of air from the surface is a great thing to do. Purists, real purists, we should be naked doing it. I mean, that's pure freediving. Everything hanging out while you're down there. Um, and so as soon as we put on a wetsuit, that's getting away from it. As soon as we put a mask, a fin, everything is getting away from the actual purity. So what I've come up with as the idea of technical freediving is the use of gases other than normoxic gases, like 21% oxygen that we're breathing right now in this room for whatever that job might be. Um, and working in movies, um, working in competitions where our safety divers are doing huge dives very close together and we want to have that safety margin. So. Um, that's the idea of using oxygenated mixtures, either post-dive or sometimes pre-dive, mm -hmm. um, to reduce decompression stress, being a big one. I've been bent. I've been unconscious from a type 2 neurological hit, I believe, uh, from scooter free diving at one point. Um, so decompression stress, decompression illness, uh, fatigue, exhaustion, recovery, recover lactic, um, we give our athletes five minutes of oxygen after every dive. They're allowed to do that. Um, and reduce surface intervals as well. So there's working free dives that we do shooting different expeditions or shooting things where we can mm. cut off 40% mm. of, uh, of our, of our um, surface intervals. So, you know, where I could probably do the same dives... I just couldn't do as many in a day, or I couldn't, um, or, or you know, a couple days into it, I would be needing breaks. Mm. So, you know, I get it. There's people who think it's cheating, and, and it's an advantage, much, much like the rest of your equipment is, and sometimes it's warranted to have that, and other times, you know, it's just uh, used for what it is. Mm. Yeah, and, and by the way, I don't really get this thing of cheating because no one is talking about using it in a competition. It's right, for your right. own enjoyment and your, as far as it's done safe, I mean, it's cheating regarding what, you know? So <laughs> right. me, I'm 100% in it. I think in competition, it's the, <laughs> no, but it's the future of competition safety for me. Like, yeah. mm. because you see some kind of incidents like we had in the last CMAS World Championships, for example, with a safety diver who I, I heard later that he even squeezed during his dive. He had a long squeeze, but you see the safety diver going down to 30, 35 meters. You see the diver blacking out at 37, 40 meters and the safety diver coming up because he, he didn't feel like he could go grab it and bringing up. Yeah. But with breathing gases before, you can do that kind of dive to 30 meters for several minutes easy. So you can, you can provide a much, much better safety for competitions, for example. I think that's, to me, that's revolutionary for mm. the next few years. We used to say in uh, early tech diving, you know, we went to mix gas, well, the same reason everyone did, for safety and performance. I mean, it gives you both uh, used as a tool, so... Um. Yeah, and for performances, why not imagine one day limiting narcosis for the deep diver, because at one point, for some of us, it becomes the limitation. You, you're so high at the bottom that mm. you cannot do anything else, so... Yeah. Please. But let's be careful there. Oxygen has the same narcotic potential, basically, as nitrogen does. So you're not going to replace nitrogen with oxygen, remove your narcotic potential. I think that the technical free diving from a safety or almost considered a professional or a service point of view makes sense. We just have to be very careful about the limits. Because mm. if you have somebody who's going down and they want to be in a position to rescue someone, they potentially have a pretty big physical burden that they have to deal with. You want to make sure that person isn't close to, close, too close to a limit for O2 toxicity. I, I, but, but I mean, if we look at O2 toxicity, agree, Neil, I mean, we had this discussion yesterday about 1.6. Your concern is 1.6 being an, a, an established limit to figure out a mix for a maximum depth that we would use. And in the recreational community, we pulled back, you know, technical nitrox into the 1.4 uh, community. Um, but for a free diver, 1.6, that would, I mean, I'm breathing a nitrox mixture in a way right now. You know, most of my nitrox mixture is 21% called normoxic. Right. And that would limit every free diver to 53 meters if, 
you know, so when you look at the, the competitive side, I mean, within a year of training, a person who's really into the competitive side or just line diving for a personal advantage is easily getting into the 60 meter range. We're already going past that, that 1.6 PO2 anyway. But now let's back up. I'm not talking about someone who's doing a simple exposure for themselves. I'm talking about somebody who's there to provide oh. safety for someone else. That's a different level of commitment. And Hmm. my major concern is not whether 1.4, 1.6 is the perfect number. I'm saying we don't have the data, so we have to, we have to approach this cautiously. Hmm. That's really my only point. What you don't want is someone who's doing something with the express belief that is making them more effective and then having a problem that would potentially result Agreed. in a double fatality. That's my yeah. concern. Information. But I, th I think when we look at how we practice safety, we always practice as if we're on air anyway. I mean, mm. we figure out the diver's time, we figure out the time we're going to meet them, we give ourselves that 10 second hang window um, for when we should leave the surface to meet them at one third depth, be there for 10 seconds, and then follow them to the surface from there. Mm. Um, having that 32% versus that 21% you were breathing on just gives you that extra little bit of boost. I don't think we're using the 32% or whatever that gas might be in which to extend our time down there. So yeah. in a safety point of view, we actually use it. We work everything as if it's an air profile, so to speak. But we have that back it's a advantage. Buffer. We have that yeah. back advantage of the oxygen mixture. Yeah. If every exactly probably a lot of people that hear about sorry. I, I worry that there's a lot of people out in the free dive community that hear about using nitrox mixes, but they don't have the good ba technical background that you do. And I remember back in 2000 and that when we were starting some stuff in Canada, there was a very famous free diver that had his ideas on how uh, technical went and that, and he had some of the information but he didn't know how to apply it properly. And that's what I worry about some people that think that they know how to apply it and maybe don't as well. So that's one thing to be mm. cautious of for sure. Cause like Kirk, he has a strong background in it right. and understands it and teaches it to our people and that, but you, you always wonder about internet divers. Sure. That is the problem. It's the, if a little is good, more is better. Right. And if someone says, gee, I, um, you have a challenge. We did some work for, for special forces years ago they were trying to find a way to augment breath hold time. And we were using hyperventilation and oxygen inspiration. And one of the things we found with some of our subjects who were not responsive to CO2, the extra oxygen was allowing them to hold their breath long enough that they became completely, frankly, intoxicated by CO2. Hmm. We had someone reaching 104 millimeters of mercury, PCO2, which is a pretty high load. And that person was absolutely dysfunctional. Hmm. Hmm. And so you have to remember that people have good intentions, but if we don't keep on the front burner the, the concern of limits and conservatism, people will take it too far. Yeah, then the thing, the, it needs to be developed by people who know what to do and we need to be cautious about it. But on the other hand, uh, just like they did when they started tech diving, you, you cannot tell people, uh, like, if they want to take a different mix, they will take it. And, right. But... This, yeah, it goes through awareness and being cautious and, and telling people to be cautious, but at one point you it, cannot... It, uh, it sounds <laughs> to me too like we all, and you mentioned this in your talk, Neil, almost a different model to look at uh, CNS toxicity because obviously free, free divers are not going down, yeah. breathing, continue to breathe gas at 1.6 or 1.8 or whatever, 1.4, whatever it is, and then have some tox event. I mean, it's a yeah, totally big, different physiology. The right? biggest thing to realize is that much of the information we learn from compressed gas diving does not translate because of the fast transit times of right. the free diver. Right. And so we have to be careful not to take too much from that world and apply it directly. And so I think we do have problems, like narcosis is a good example, um, and decompression sickness. I believe, I'll use decompression sickness as the example. I think we do get it in free diving because of the fast ascent rate. If you're coming up at a slower ascent rate as a compressed gas diver, you're clearing out that fast brain tissue by the time you get up to the surface. Right. In free diving, you're not. So you get that transient, very bad state. If you don't think differently, you won't appreciate that because you'll look at the diving literature and go, nope, not a problem, DCS can't occur. Right.
So what are the prospects of getting someone to, to look at these, you know, maybe develop a new model or look at the whole toxicity? Money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <that's laughs> so is it even realistic that someone, I mean, how to talk about that a little, like, like that study, yeah. that particular study to look at limits? Well, for- you have to be, uh, the biggest challenge we have are the ethics. If you're doing human subject studies, you have to get ethical approval. And I'll give you an example. Maybe I shouldn't on camera, but I was working with Kirk at one point. We were trying to find bubbles um, during deep scooter dives Mm -hmm. because I'm interested to seeing if we could see gas phase in the heart. It would be very transient because it's so short-lived, but we wanted to do it. But we had ethical approval to watch. And so they were doing what they did, and they did what they did. And he said, you know, this isn't, we're not getting anything. What would you like us to do? I said, I can't tell you what to do because that's not my role. He said, well, what kind of exposure do you think might give you the answer? I said, well, if somebody went the 250 feet and then came up really fast and was on this swim grid in five seconds so I could scan them, that actually would be the perfect scenario. And he sat there for a few minutes. He said, guys, do you know what I want to do? <laughs> yeah. But that's, you have to be cautious. It's really the ethical consideration. We have a hard time designing studies when you start talking about O2 toxicity and you talk about seizures. Uh, it's difficult. Yeah, well, that in itself is has that. Difficulty. And I think when you look at the amount of people that are going to be employing it, is you know it's going to be small. When you look at the free diving, it's a very small slice of the diving pie that we know of, although getting much bigger. And then when you parse it down into Mm -hmm. kind of technical or advanced size. So, yeah. Hmm. Other, other, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So other research, so that's obviously something that would be good Good to know. Are there other specific studies or research? To me, I'll tell you the the real research priority is to keep collecting information on cases. But we have to go beyond collecting case reports or, uh, pardon me, news reports or online items. People who are involved in cases have to feel they're not going to be criminalized because of it so we can get the straight story on what happens because that really will help us redefine limits. I think that is the critical thing. Make sure people are willing to share the true story. Yeah, that's a good one. Are we talking about research now? Sure, yeah. Let's, yes, okay. please. Okay. So, um, I mean, some of the things that apply to all free divers, especially as we get a little deeper, is going to be that of decompression modeling. Um, you know, it would be nice to have a, not a Bowman ZHL 16 table that's, you know, designed for scuba, but let's try it for free diving and see if it works. What would be the actual Mm. surface intervals that we should employ? What is that gas modeling? How can I put it into my computer? And then I want from a technical point of view to be able to put in the mixes. So that would certainly be one that I, I, I would be interested in seeing. Another one would be, for example, uh, recovery breathing. I mean, we developed the idea of hook breathing and cleansing breaths um, in the mid to late 90s. And have we actually figured out, has there actually been research on what is the model of the best Mm. type of recovery breath upon getting to the surface? And um, so, I mean, those would be two simple ones off the top. Yeah. Um, I have one I would be very interested in is like we same as we get a bit deeper and sometimes you don't need to go very deep and for beginners you, you have people experiencing pulmonary edema and trachea squeeze and like for people who train very regularly it can be some people squeeze way easier than others so mm. now we, we start knowing that there is genetics involved but my main concern is the healing of it. Like, because it's always the question you get from your students, from people who squeeze, is like, how long do I stay out of the water? What can I do? Can I stretch? Can I hold my breath on dry? Can I do sport? Can I, can, should I do absolutely nothing? For how long? When I go in the water, how fast can I increase the depths again? These are questions I think every single freediver who is confronted to this has uh. absolutely no answer. Like, we give answers based on our, on our experiences, on our other students and athletes' experiences, but like real studies about this specifically, about the healing, 
Uh, but but yeah. those are studies that we cannot do yeah, ethically. Yeah, because you, you cannot and, and so, help someone to study. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what Kirk wants is actually a little bit more, we can model, but realize, like the Buhlman model, it doesn't fit the time frame right. yeah. of free diving. So really, you're talking about a whole new model. And you could model it mathematically, but it would be tested in concept. It would be tested on the ground by people. That's really the best you can do. But what you're talking about, squeezes are important, and I would love to see data like that. But this is a constant struggle. When we set standards and guidelines, we don't know because we can't hurt people to find the answer, right. nor do we want to. Right. And we volunteer to do it, but they won't let us. <laughs> <All right. Yeah. laughs> but I, I, I know there were a, a, a few studies, like in some world championships, like they, but uh, but the thing is like a follow up after, yeah. but yeah. just. To know how long before it's completely healed or so, things but, like this would be interesting, but I but, guess you know. Okay, we can, <laughs> we can observe people in the event. We can see when they get a squeeze. We can see how much blood they, they cough up. That's fine. But how do we test if it's fully healed? Yeah, that's the thing. Our yeah. diagnostic <laughs> no methods idea. are slowly getting better. We're actually doing a study now where we're trying to use hyperbaric oxygen to enhance MRI imaging, to mm. magnetic resonance mm. imaging. It's not impossible. One day we will be able to really assay the lung effectively. But right now, it's really hard to know when something is fully healed, mm. other than putting you through that stress and see if you get hurt again, yeah. <laughs> which we can't do. Right. And I, I, I'm guessing the military is not really interested. In so no, many they, want, they want healthy like, people, and they're not that interested because they have enough people, too, that if somebody had a problem, they will bring them out of the rotation. Right. And so they are not interested in the high risk. Interestingly enough, the military is very risk averse when it right. comes to research. Yeah. And so there's no one who could do this. I think Matty Ray was right that the free divers would be willing to take on a lot of these risks. I think yeah. we could find people willing, but we wouldn't find university ethics boards that were willing to accept that risk. I think a lot of the early limits on diving, too, were done by military before all the ethical considerations to do some of those early oxygens, the Lambertson. And oh, those and, and Ken Donald's work. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that was military when, when your military people followed orders. And that was... <laughs> yeah. You're being volunteered. Volun <laughs> voluntold. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. um, we are... I, I would like to just touch on one other thing and then maybe take some questions. You have questions in the audience? We have some questions? Yeah, good. Um, just, uh, I found it interesting uh, uh, listening to talks today about uh, human divers down, uh, support diving. Uh, I know the PFI has the rebreather divers and all. You talked about that. Uh, versus the, uh, you were talking about dive eye, uh, which is uh, an ROV basically, right, that you send down it matches the diver and, and photographs. I'm just wondering about where you see the future of uh, support diving going. And, and if the machine is, is like the dive eye is, is, is going to be very prominent in the future, or dive eyes, you know, like, I like them. I think both have a place. Huh? It, um, being, I, I think both have a place because um, redundancy, extra, extra eyes on you is always a good thing. Yeah. As somebody that's done world records and lots of competitions and that, I like having somebody that's properly trained that has eyes and can tell somebody what's happening. I'm not a blip on a screen or a camera that runs out of battery or stuff like that, but that's also realizing that um, free divers tend to be cheap <clears throat> as well and safety divers. I think that's divers in yeah, general. Yeah, <laughs> rebreather <laughs> divers that, that have the proper training. It's expensive to bring them to most locations, you know, right. not all locations that are conducive to free diving have great support for technical divers, uh, technical rebreather divers. Right. And um, we've seen in the past teams that have been thrown together people that while they can dive deep, they don't they, they don't have the know-how to do it for free divers. They can barely handle taking care of themselves, let alone the possibility of taking care of a free diver. Mm -hmm. So like our team's been in training for how long now? 13 years. And uh, they have training that they go through every, every year, every competition they get tested and, and everything like that. So they know their stuff. Aid International, the president has said that our team is the one team that has been recognized by Ada and can be used. And they're more than happy to come to any competition because they absolutely love it. Um, but, you know, it, it would be good to have both of them. I personally want to have those people down there. I like having the eyes on me and our guys like it. They can actually intervene. You know, yep. they're down there with a 
with a, a lift bag that's incorporated into a scuba system, they can hook onto your lanyard. They can bring you to the surface. They, they can recognize something in you and initiate from the surface you know, what needs to happen that way. I agree, dive eye, it's a great thing, be able to see what's happening to that person. Um, but, you know, but what's caught. dive eye, $30,000? <laughs> Altogether, yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> There's cheap to free yeah. numbers. <laughs> at, at the moment, Diva is really expensive, but I do hope, like in the future, that it'll become more affordable. And there might be, you know, drones that we can buy ourselves and use ourselves in our own competitions. Because, like, it sounds to me like that having a scuba diver there is the same as having someone on a screen who's watching you close up, high definition, and can drop a counter ballast and bring you to the surface if they have to. But our guys can actually go up to you and untangle your lanyard or send you up quick on there because you can we've done tests and you can go up a lot faster with a lift bag on your lanyard than on a counterbalance pulling you up so there's a few different things and for um incident um um going through accidents as well there's there there have been problems at competitions um where there's been big delays for different reasons but it's always guessing at kind of what it is and it's nice to have, you know, both cameras and people that can think and see firsthand to know exactly what's going on, to give feedback to stop it from happening again in the future. That's, that's a big thing, too. Yeah, and also because I think with Diva, even if you have very high definition at one point, you have two or three people who are on the platform and trying to decide, should we release the counterbalance? Like when you are there, like watching with your own eyes the person, I think it's way easier to decide, okay, now it's time to bring it up and you don't yeah. even hesitate. You put the, the balloon or whatever you use. And, yeah. and also, probably, I, I don't know exactly your how you work, but you like imagine you have the diver as an issue like at 80 meters and the line is 100 meters, then time for the counter yes. balance to come up from those 20 meters is already 20 seconds lost when the yep. diver could have helped. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. And one thing I really love too, just on a non-safety side, I love hearing them cheer you on after you've grabbed your tag. <laughs> you know, that's like your split second where you get a smile and be like, damn, I made that, you know, and then you still know that you have the return to go but you know you have those people watching and already celebrating for you down there which is it, it's nice to have that human contact when you're down deeper than you've ever been before the uh, the main thing with um yeah scuba safety i think is that how risky is a 80 90 100 meter dive for a free diver and is it more risky for this person on scuba or that's why they need to yeah. be properly trained and that's what i said yeah. there's been teams in the past where the divers can barely handle themselves and that's why ada said that they have to be vetted and know who the team is who the divers are to know if they can actually handle that and like not only take care of themselves but take care of somebody else as well and that's part of the problem with with deep safeties too you need all, the right people should all competitions be you know like a certain level of competition to a certain depth can have a certain level of safety and then as you move deeper more safety you increase it i'm oh, sorry I think we're, at, we're actually out of time, but we're going to go to some questions. Uh, I, I think we could probably talk for another hour. Yes, thank you. I think we got it. There was a question uh, there. Oh, yep. Yeah. I was just wondering, how often do you see blackout in um, sort of initial freediver training in the courses that you've run? I would. S Let me take a pause here. Okay. You, you guys have to go catch a plane. Yeah, so Amber, yeah. Adam, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm interested to know in the introductory freediving courses that are becoming increasingly common in Australia in particular, um, how frequently do you see blackouts in the new trainees? I can't speak to Australia, but just in general, um, they happen occasionally. And we shouldn't, it, here's my opinion, we shouldn't be afraid of them. We tell our students straight up, listen, you're getting into a sport that has you intentionally going through a level of hypoxia. That risk is to, first off, be debilitated with a loss of motor control. That could potentially lead into a blackout. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We should, uh, if it happens, embrace that it happened, use it as the best learning experience possible for everyone involved, and uh, understand that no harm, no foul. And the advantage of it is that everyone in that class that saw it or experienced it 
understands that this isn't something theoretical that's not going to happen to me. Mm. It happens, and it drives home the point about having proper safety there. Um, there's typically, you know, the resolution is very simple and straightforward. I mean, we all experience it in some form or fashion. How many of us have stood up really quick and felt a little lightheaded and dizzy? That's a, that's hypoxia because of blood flow to the brain issue. So we shouldn't be scared of it, but we should be concerned when we don't have the proper systems in place to take care of it. Now, we don't want people to get to that point, but if it does happen, certainly we're not afraid to embrace it and to really learn from it as the best experience that you could have from a learning point of view. Like I've, I've seen very few in courses, but the one thing that I can tell you when it does happen, it is such a shock to the buddy because um, the instructor's right there helping deal with it. Like you're trying to get them to, to get into action too. But like Kirk said, it, it snaps them into the reality that it can happen and how easily it can happen. And it makes those people safer in the long run as well because they, they know that it's not that thing that happens to the person that is trying to push too hard. It can happen to anyone at any time. Uh, and the other question I had was um, just going back to oxygen toxicity. Have there been any documented cases of oxygen toxicity in freedivers yet? So the battery in you. Oh, not quite. And only from people who would make the mistake of thinking they could die vertically on pure oxygen. In terms of in the modern world, no. It's a theoretical risk at this point. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, here. Sorry to bother you of a question. Last one of the day, I'm sure. Hi, guys. Um, very good discussion. Thanks, panel. My name is Belinda. I am from the Solomon Islands. Um, so, pleased to meet you guys. I have a personal re reference that might, might me want to meet you. But I have a question. So, we are, um, we are seeing a lot of independent resorts and free diving shops opening up in the small resort um, market in the Solomon Islands. Uh, I am the only dive operation in the Solomons that is that has a free diving center. Um, I'm super concerned because we have one accident in the Solomon Islands, um, and it's probably going to happen if I see the, the crazy things that these people are doing. How? What can I do um, as part of the Chamber of Commerce and part of a lot of ministries? What is a quick, a quick? ABC for me to go back and push back to the government and push back to these operators. What do I do to make sure that we don't have a catastrophe happening? And coincidentally, I was just um, in Mauritius uh, a couple of weeks ago and looking up doing a free diving yoga thing there as well and just met with two, two new agencies setting up and coming in and my heart almost stopped when I hear about some of the stuff that these people are doing. What can we do um, to help um, and, and make sure that we have the scientific backing or whatever we need to be able to push back, especially in a country like the Solomon Islands? I know we're going to have an accident. I can see it. But what do I do? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I have my own experience from Philippines when I talked about this guy who is teaching like crazy things. And I, I know that, for example, in France, there are like more restricting laws that what all agencies propose in scuba diving, in free diving as well. Uh, and in Philippines at the moment, they are talking like the, the Filipino free divers, they went to the government and are pushing so that, for example, only certified, recognized agency are allowed to officially teach free diving, for example, and we are pushing to, for this as well. <laughs> Uh, and maybe that's a possibility as well to... I think, I think you know, you, you touch on it there. You've got to uh, put together your package of what is freediving education, who are the, uh, the associations that are the governing bodies that are recognized that are doing it. And, um, and typically, they will have an insurance uh, certificate. They'll have a master policy, um, which means they've been vetted in a way. I mean, Lloyd's of London is, is okay with that person uh, teaching that sanctioned program. Um, and it comes down to that liability, that commercial aspect of it. So, I mean, that would be one way in which you've got the check mark that it's been a vetted 
uh, program. And so that would be something potentially to take to the government, hitting it from the tourism side point of view. What would be the tragedy to tourism if suddenly there's a whole bunch of fly by night, hey, I can spell free diving, I'm going to start teaching it. And we get fatality after fatality. Because as we talked before, there are no gatekeepers in this. Anyone can say I'm a free diver and, I, and I'm teaching free diving. And does the public at large know any different? about it, um, whereas scuba typically does have, especially in some countries and even in, in Quebec and Canada, a provincial government has a very um, governing body of how it regulates diving in general. So that might be one aspect of how you hit that nail. Uh, like I, I handle a lot of the back end of uh, of our company performance freediving, and I hear so many people saying, you know, like I'm, I'm going to, you know, somewhere in Indonesia or something like that, and so and so is teaching me, and they say the name of the dive school, and I've never heard of that agency before, and it's just people deciding that they can free dive, and so they're teaching it, and so I try to um, counsel people <laughs> when they're going away to make sure they're finding reputable dive agencies that actually have standards. But it's, it's going to be a, a battle for a while, unfortunately. We have time for a last question, if anyone has one. Please. Hi. Um, look, as a doctor, I completely understand the stuff that Neil explained very perfectly yesterday for us about how hyperventilation uh, alters your break point and, and makes you reach hypoxia before you reach break point. From a theoretical point of view, that makes perfectly good sense for me. From, from a practical point of view, I don't understand the significance, the significance of it. I'm a, you know, very much a novice freediver. I've done the first freedive course and when we were doing our rescue, I was coming up, I was contracting fully. My body was well and truly at break point. I was trying to breathe. But what is the significance of actually reaching the break point before you black out? Like, I mean, you can't do anything about it. Well, you can't just reach for your egg and breathe. Yeah, Brett, your drive was primarily driven by the CO2. So you weren't hyperventilating. Had you have hyperventilated enough, you would have abolished those warnings. So you were guided by your normal physiology. But this is what's removed when you do the excessive hyperventilation. There's zero warning because you don't get a CO2, a PCO2 level that gives you any kind of signal. No, I, I understand that. I'm just saying. Oh, sorry. Okay, Brett, go. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to say that, you know, you reach the break point. All the break point really does is tell you that you need to breathe. Right. right? You can't do anything about it. So even though I'm coming up to the surface, if it's far enough... I can still black out and I can still die. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can definitely still black out. You just do it without any warning whatsoever <laughs> when you add the hyperventilation in there. And probably more comfortably. Yeah, doing self, any self, sort of self-rescue or letting your buddy know, you, you eliminate yeah. the chance yeah. of doing any of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's what I'm asking the freedivers is for, you know, from a practical point of view, reaching the break point, what can you do and what... Because, I mean, a lot of the training is to actually teach you to ignore those, that horrible feeling of feeling well, hypoxic. I it? mean, I, I would say in, <laughs> I would say that, you, you know, you're talking about a vertical dive and hitting your break point. So um, did you actually reach your true break point? Did you take a breath or did you get to the surface and survive? Did you drown? I mean, break point is the point at which you <laughs> take it in how I would define it. Um, up until that point is the urge to breathe leading up to break point. So a lot of times when we're doing vertical dives, we're experiencing an urge to breathe while we're still getting to the surface. And then we're getting to the surface and going through our proper safety or surface protocols and things like that. Where you really experience break point is in static apnea, when you're face down in the water. Because that one, you can take it right to the very last <gasps> come up and out of the water. And probably there you're experiencing a true break point. So, um, you know, up until that point, as you get more experience, you're going through that level of discomfort from that urge to breathe, which is leading up to the break point. So by doing limited hyperventilation, safe limited hyperventilation, what you're doing is just pulling back on that 
that the intensity of that urge to breathe. It's still there, it's delayed, and then it's still an urge to breathe uh, leading up to the break point. It's just giving you a little bit more comfortable of a, of a free dive. It's the excessiveness from being able to stay longer or to cause alkalinity in the blood where the red blood cells don't actually let go of the oxygen, which is you know the issue with excessive hyperventilation. Well a short one. That, yeah, you know, and, and the thing is, you don't reach this break point like easily. Like even when you're trained, uh, you need a lot of mental strength and training to 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 black out on a, on a static, for example. I never managed to get really, really hypoxic on a static. It's not my best discipline, okay? But still, like. Before that, all this urge to breathe Kirk was talking about is like a survival instinct. So you are going to turn and come back up way before you reach your breaking point. Uh, uh, unless you are really, really trained to push like crazy, uh, usually you want to survive, you turn back up way before you reach that. We have to end now. We're out of time. Thank you so much, panel, for being here and uh, coming. And thank you, audience. Thanks.